Right then. Um, yes, I'm going to give it a bit of time for everyone to jump on board. Um, hello, 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 everybody that's um, currently coming to watch the live stream. Um, I've just done a YouTube live stream that should be on my wall and on Twitter um, of Joe Black, um, singer, songwriter and musician, who did a, a nice song for us under the Gandhi statue. Um, I'm glad people are joining now. I may as well let you in on the surprise exclusive. Um, today I'm outside Parliament and we're just about to make our way down to um, Downing Street. The lady you see in front of me dressed in green with the blue rucksack is Chelsea Manning's mum, um, Susan Manning. And uh, this is, you know, a, a huge honour for me to, to meet her today. And I've already had a chance to have a chat with her and say hello and uh, thank her on behalf of all the free thinkers and critical thinkers out there uh, to, to, to go back um, with our, um, our, our fond wishes for um, Chelsea. Um, as I say, they're going to go down to Downing Street and they're going to do a reading of the UN report um, outside of Downing Street um, Hall. And as I say, um, we're, we're absolutely honoured today to have um, uh, Chelsea Manning's mum with us, Susan Manning. And uh, I'm hoping to have a few words with her um, after the, the UN report reading. I, I think it's only fair that uh, uh, these guys get all the things they need to do out of the way. Um, and that involves a, a quick march down to Downing Street, um, where Kieran um, will will be uh, starting off the reading. There's quite a bit of it to go through, so each person's going to take a bit of time each um, to uh, to read a little bit of it. So I'll be live streaming that. And as I say, if we do uh, if we do all right, I'm hoping to have a, a word with um, Chelsea Manning's mum, Susan, who is who's kindly agreed to come in today, come down today, and is also going to be at the um, vigil this evening, six in between six and eight. Um, Susan Manning will be there so if you, you'd like to come down and if you have anything to say um, yeah, if you have any, want to express uh, any feelings you know and um, gratuities towards um, Chelsea um, I'm hoping to be able to have an, um, an interview with her a bit later on um, but obviously we're going to get the formalities of the readings out of the way that's Joe Black there with the, uh, with the guitar on his back if you have a look on my wall you'll see a, a, a quick live stream with Joe performing underneath the Gandhi statue and just before that there was another botched live stream where I'd lost uh, the signal um, where I was uh, explaining just what is going on today and, um, uh, and what, why it's so important you guys tune in and share this um, this broadcast because this one will go on until um, until we now uh, finish at Downing Street and then I'm straight over to um, the Ecuadorian Embassy where I'm going to plant myself for the rest of the day because I'm carrying a kit bag that is weighing rather a lot um, but please share this on Twitter especially if you're on Twitter can you do me a favor can you share it um, as at Kieran O'Reilly that's C-I-A-R-O-N O'Reilly um, he is um, the guy to tweet this to. Uh, also at Suzy 3 d S-U-Z-I-3-D, that would be good. Ladies, I think we're away. <laughs> um, so if you could tweet that out again. Also, if, you, if an editor out there on the uh, Joe Public Says No page can um, share it to the Joe Public Says No page. Also... Um, if there's a if there's an editor for whistleblowers, I'd, I'd, I'd really like it if you could share that too. I've dish, I've tried to uh, attach the tags before I started streaming, and it just wouldn't have any of it. So um, I'm I'm relying on uh, you guys that are actually uh, watching right now to share on Twitter and Facebook um, as far and wide as you can, because obviously this is an exclusive. We've got uh, Susan Manning here, Chelsea Manning's mum. And that, to me, is uh, it's legendary. You know, I, I'm I'm honoured to be uh, in her company, and I'm really looking forward to um, chatting with her later. Um, if I can get permission, then I'm going to uh, do a little video interview with her that I can upload for you a bit later on. 
but we're going to go make our way down to uh, Downing Street now where the reading will take place and then uh, we'll see where we go from there it's, it's a little bit dangerous on the road so forgive me if I focus on getting across the road rather than um, what's going on on the screen um, but as I say huge news we've got um, Susan Manning with us and uh, Kieran and Lisa and myself uh, are going to make our way down to Downing Street now um, where Kieran's going to start off the reading of, um, of the UN report into Julian's arbitrary detention um, I think we ought to hold up for the rest of them you know they're still stuck at the traffic lights but uh, yeah so as you can see oh please pick up truck so as you can see um, it was a little bit last minute cobbled together I, I couldn't say anything last night because I was um, well sworn to secrecy as such and uh, and now we're actually here um, I'm really quite delighted to find um, Chelsea's mum here and uh, as I say she will be outside the Ecuadorian embassy tonight between 6 and 8 along with Vivian Westwood Laurie Love um, and other campaigners and um, high profile activists keynote speakers that are going to go down and uh, make their voices heard with regard to um, uh, Julian's current ar arbitrary detention um, but yeah we're going to be making our way down I mean the traffic lights seem to be taking forever um, I'll have to tell you now that I've had uh, maybe two hours sleep I got to sleep at approximately uh, 1, one thirty, and I was up again at 4 for my coach because that was the cheapest co coach I could get, 5.20 in the morning. Um, that rocked in at 9.30 and uh, I've been bumming around the city ever since waiting uh, for everyone to turn up here at 1 o'clock. Um, now they're all here, everyone's going to make their way down to Downing Street and um, after the reading I, I think actually um, Susan's going to do some reading as well so that will be quite nice and as I say if we're uh, if we're really really lucky I might be able to get a, a full on interview with her what I might do depending on how things go is I might have a break um, once we finish the uh, UN report reading at, uh, at Downing Street uh, whilst I skip over to um, Knightsbridge and then when we get to Knightsbridge, I will probably do another live stream um, in between uh, sort of like four and six. And then I will do a final live stream, which will be the speakers. I mean, uh, I believe there's some uh, buskers and some musicians coming down. Uh, so there'll be a bit of music. Everybody? Uh, okay. One is... I sent out, I sent out the wrong, wrong live stream. Don't worry. I've got it. It's already taken care of, Kieran. I've got people sending it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yo, Joe. Yes, Roscoe. Um, yeah, for those joining late, I don't know. I'm losing losing more than I'm gaining here. And it's probably because I'm a crap broadcaster, but, you know, I don't get paid, so... Um, but, yep, yeah, the... Um, the, 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 the day is looking really, really cool. Uh, the people, I don't know if you guys can see, but the lady um, down there in the green, this is uh, Susan Manning, Chelsea Manning's mum. And uh, we're, uh, all, we're all going down to uh, Downing Street, where there's going to be a reading and, um, uh, of the UN report. Apparently the UN report is quite damning, so I am interested in hearing what the UN has got to say. Um, Although I do have an issue with the UN, as you know, we all, we all know the, the, the UN is, is a puppet, toothless tiger, really, these days. Um, it, only ever, it only ever gets taken notice of when it, when, when it benefits a government, a Western government. If it's something that uh, a Western government doesn't agree with, it just says, ah, fuck you. Right, so, I don't know, uh, I'm glad to say that uh, I'm not organising all of this. This is all down to Kieran which is why we're marking time here by this telephone box. Um, and for those that are just joining, as I say, 
Um, the great news or the, the exciting news that I couldn't share yesterday is that Susan Manning, Chelsea Manning's mum, is with us today outside Downing Street, or will be in a minute, and uh, we'll be speaking at the Ecuadorian Embassy tonight along with Vivian Westwood and Lowry Love. Um, uh, hopefully I'm going to be able to get a, a short interview, a quick interview with her a bit later that I can either do on video, depending on how she feels, or um, or do on live stream because uh, I've been told, you know, she, she, she's very wary of the media, obviously, but I'm not media, um, you know, I'm, I'm just Joe Public. So hopefully um, when we get to the Ecuadorian embassy a bit later, I can sit down, maybe buy Sir Susan a cup of coffee and, and just have a chat about how um, Chelsea is, um, what sort of um, uh, uh, issues is he facing now. Um, it, obviously, she's going to be very happy that his sentence was commuted. What, what, uh, what, um, what sort of things are... Um... Oh, hang on. One minute, yeah? Okay, doke. So as you hear, we're off um, in a minute's time for a, a wander down to... Um, the Houses of Parliament, uh, down to Downing Street even, where I'm going to live stream this reading um, of the UN report. And then, um, uh, depending on what happens with these guys, I'm probably going to head over to the Ecuadorian Embassy almost straight away in case people are rallying there. So if there are people rallying there, um, I can't read the screen, it's too bright here. Um, I can see you've written something, Ken, but I can't read what it says. Um, it's, it's a pain in the arse for the sun out. I literally can't see anything. Um, but I know, I know you've, you've said something. I, I will get a chance to, to read it at some point and respond. Um, I'm going to have to just get a bigger screen, I think. Maybe a tablet or something like that. Um, but yeah, it looks like we're, um, we're on the move. So I'm going, to, um, I'm going to bring up the rear, I think. I'm going to go down behind everybody and, uh, and bring up the rear. Tail and Charlie. Yeah, that's better. Um, uh, this might take some time. <coughs> and so, yeah, it's absolutely beating hot out here today. Um, and it's got to be about 26 degrees when that sun's out. It's burning. Uh, so I might get a little bit hot and bothered a bit later on. <coughs> but I, I, um, I think I'll be a bit better when I drop this kit bag of mine because it actually does weigh a ton, um, this one. It weighs a little more than I hoped it would, actually. Um, Right, now, let's see if I can read these comments, because I couldn't see them in the sun. Put the spotlight on. City York. Uh, Yorkshire. I can't read, it's too small. I should have put the glasses on. But, um, yeah. The, the exciting news today is that we're with um, Susan Manning. And Susan Manning is the mother of Chelsea Manning. Uh, whistleblower who was... Um, detained and tortured in America. If you look on my, uh, he's, he's had his sentence commuted, he wasn't pardoned, he's had his sentence commuted, but uh, um, I'm hoping to get a, a bit of an interview later with uh, Susan, if she's up to it. I mean, uh, she's a very frail lady and uh, doesn't want to be overwhelmed, so, you know, it's just a matter of good manners. Um, I'll wait until she gets to the Ecuadorian embassy and is settled in a chair. They've provided her a little chair and some refreshments. And uh, people will be able to go over and say hello and maybe, you know, so, some messages of support for, um, for Chelsea um, that can go back. So if you are in the vicinity of London or central London um, and you can make your way to Knightsbridge, um, you should. And that'll be the Brompton Road exit of Knightsbridge Tube. And just walk 100 yards straight ahead. Um, in an hour's time, I hope to be finished here um, with the, the reading of the UN report. And then I'm jumping straight on a train and heading over to, uh, to Knightsbridge because I want to dump this bag, set up a, a stand for me, uh, for me camera, and then 
just chill out for the rest of the afternoon because I've had about an hour, uh, two hours sleep and it wasn't even sleep, you know, it was nowhere near sleep. Um, wasn't level seven sleep, that's for sure. But um, yeah, so that's the, that's the, the, the brilliant news that I couldn't share um, yesterday. Um, and that is, you know, I am I am overwhelmed to know that I'm in the company of um, Chelsea Manning's mum, um, who has been through the mill herself. You know, that, if you can just imagine um, the the impact, the psychological impact on a mother when uh, a child, their, their child, is incarcerated, tortured, and abused um, by the U.S. government and the U.S. military. Um, all for telling the truth, all for blowing the whistle. And that's what today is all about, whistleblowers. Um, Julian Assange, obviously, six years arbitrarily detained, six years today um, in the Ecuadorian embassy, eight years in total, including the two years house arrest. So as you can see, it, you know, there's, there, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of reason to be out today making a noise for Julian Assange. Um, and I've got my Australian flag in my bag that's got free Assange written on it in um, huge great letters and at the bottom it says Ya Flaming Galar which I thought was quite funny at the time but you know I don't know on second thought it's probably not something I can hang outside the Ecuadorian embassy um, but God it's I, I've, I've seen uh, you know if this were a march we might have a bit of a problem Hold on. And um, again, again, yes. It's the It's like the relaunch's final time. We had a glorious past representing the boards of many of the stadiums. The stadiums. And so, we're going to go out there. I'll introduce you. Go about the Joe will sing a song. Lisa will be concentrating on her new role and starting this. And she'll read about four paragraphs and then she'll hand it. It seems like people reading this. Do we see anyone else wants to volunteer? Lisa, Joe, me, Moises. Okay? So we'll just do four paragraphs each. And you don't have to yell. There you go, so that's that's what's going to happen. There's four of them. They're all going to read uh, four paragraphs each of the UN um, report, uh, which are the live stream. And that's going to be happening just 100 yards up the road. Looks like they're rallying again here, just organising, getting a little briefing going. Um, the lady you see in the centre of the screen, right at the back, the very small lady, is um, Susan uh, Manning, and that's Chelsea Manning's um, mum. So we're very honoured to have... Um, such a prestigious guest today with us um, it's very humbling to have her here um, and I have obviously a huge amount of respect for Chelsea Manning and just as much for her mum because her mum obviously has been through the mill in so many different ways um, but yep yes all right I've got to keep up with a the man there look it's, it's, it's even barking orders at me now I'm a busy man. I must be influential or influenza. But yep, we're now at the gates. <laughs> right, let me see if I can find myself a nice little... Right, um, as you can see, we're right outside the gates of Parliament now, and I think Kieran's going to start off. Okay, here we are at 10 Downing Street. Uh, and I remember Utah Phillips having a quote, great quote singer, a great anarchist folk singer, Utah Phillips said, Mother Nature is not dying, she is being killed. And those killers have names and addresses, and this is the name and this is the address. In terms of the indefinite detention without charge of Julian Assange in England, ongoing sensory deprivation. Six years today. So it's important to come to places of power and today we come quite mildly just to speak and to sing. I've been arrested twice here in these gates here over Chelsea Manning. 
and uh, Chelsea grew up in Wales in, England, in the UK and we're great, it's great to have Chelsea's mum here with us today, Susan Manny, who's come all the way from Wales to, um, to stand with Julian Assange and uh, Christine, more than anyone else, knows what Christine Assange is going through. And uh, she'll, she'll also, she also can tell Christine what it's like when her child, her loved one, is released. And that's going to be the result of the activities we take today here at 6 p.m. at the Ecuadorian Embassy. They've taken place at British consulates and embassies in Australia and the United States and other places further afield. Um, so it's great, great that people are spontaneously gathering and joining us. I want to introduce Joe Black, uh, one of the great musicians of our movement. A movement only survives on its music. On its music, we know that from the civil rights movement in the United States. What's going on? Who's going to go on? Where are you going, Joe? Yes. Get out of the backdrop. All the way from Dublin, Ireland. Joe Black, let's give it up. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. It's all about the. Uh, it's called the welcome. Some of my experiences across here back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Look out, guys!
justice served out by them gracious to the core. Call me Pat, call me Patty, call me Ticket, call me Sean. I'll ride over the crest of your unspoken hate. Call me Tinker, call me Traveler, call me Blind Drunken Traveler. I'll ride over the crest of your unspoken hate. I'll ride over Thank the you, crest of your And terrorize me You never break our spirit With your hands This land has changed the faster now Open the doors of welcome To all those in me Call me Pat Call me Patty Call me Dick and call me Thank you. That's Johnny. Thank that's you. Joe. Joe Black. It's awesome bit of music. Now, um, if you could share this link for no, me. Can you start charging? I'll, I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you. Uh, engineer at the same time. Sorry, chaps. There you go. Right. Um, yeah. If, if any of you could do me a, a quick favour here, which is um, share the link. Um, to uh, the Joe Public Says No page. If you're an editor of Joe Public Says No and you're watching this, can you share the link? Uh, same with whistleblowers. If you have any editors or um, admins uh, watching this, share it to uh, uh, that page. And especially tweet it for me. Um, and if uh, there are Twitterers out there, uh, if you could tweet it to at Kieran O'Reilly, C-I-A-R-O-N O'Reilly, and one for at Susie 3D, Susie, and then the number three and the letter D. And uh, Elizabeth Lee Voss would be nice if you could do at Elizabeth Lee Voss as well, that would be good. Um, uh, the, the more shares we've got, the better um, for this. Mind you, don't fall backwards on that. Um, and I, I think you find that they're going to be doing the reading of the UN report now, which is. Uh, it's going to be about four paragraphs each. Uh, there are four, four of them. Right. Yeah, I'm ready. We're actually live and broadcasting already. You look a bit bored over there. <laughs> yeah, hiding away, really hiding away in the corner there. Yeah, everyone about. hiding away. <laughs> right, I'm going to get in close for this. Okay, um, I'll just say, in, in terms of introducing this, uh, we all bring different gifts to the struggle. The struggle to free Julian Assange. Obviously, Joe brings great music. Other people bring... Um, uh, Dave drove all the way from Dublin. He's a good driver. Drove Susan down from Wales and Freddie there. Um, and some people... There's a great guy, Patrick, has been putting me up while I've been vigiling daily at the embassy. And uh, he cooks and uh, he's a great host. So people bring different skills. And we all come from different places. Some of us are vegans over there, Lisa Vegan. Uh, some come from the experience of the coup in Chile. Uh, Clara, who sustained 
the uh, has sustained the six years of vigiling at the embassy. Lived through that coup. Her husband was disappeared uh, 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 to prison and finally released. Moises, who's with us today, was a teenager at that point. We all come from different experiences and different backgrounds. Some are, are liberal democrats, social democrats, anarchists, Marxists, uh, Green Party, whatever. I come from a small marginal group called the Catholic Worker, and we had a great guy, uh, Adrian Hennessy, and he once said that, what good is the law? Good people don't need them, and bad people don't obey them. But um, that's, where I, that's the planet I come from. But also one of the great gifts brought to Julian has been the great team of uh, legal advisors. In uh, Australians such as Geoffrey Robertson living in London, uh, Julian Burnside uh, in Australia, uh, Jen, um, and uh, many other Australian lawyers. Um, I'm really bad at names. I'm very good under police interrogation. <laughs> I'll never give you up, okay? I'd try to, but I wouldn't. Um, so I should know more names. Uh, the great late Michael Ratner, uh, who sadly passed away, uh, was also a great lawyer in this, uh, in this attempt to free uh, Julian. So <coughs> part of that legal team's work <coughs> resulted in, um, in this ruling by the UN, who ruled that what Britain is doing here, what this man or this woman, the Prime Minister Theresa May, right the first time. I don't keep track of Prime Ministers either, uh, <laughs> is uh, doing, uh, what David Cameron did before, um, and what uh, Australian Prime Ministers, both Labour and Liberal, have done in their complicity to deny, to deny Julian Assange his basic rights, has been challenged by great legal people. And so we're going to read the finding of the um, of the UN, and you'll be next soon, because I'm not going to ask, OK? <laughs> so the opinion is 54 to 2015, <coughs> concerning Julian Assange, Sweden and the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Britain and Northern Ireland, or Occupied Ireland as we like to call it. Um, the first point, the working, the working Group on Arbitrary Detention was established in Resolution 1991-42 of the Commission on Human Rights, which extended and clarified the Working Group's mandate in its Resolution 1997-50. The Human Rights Council assumed the mandate in its decision. I hope Theresa May is listening on live stream right now. 1-102 and extended it for a three-year period in its resolution 15-18 of 30 September 2010. The mandate was extended for a further three years in resolution 24-7 on 26 September 2013. The Government of Sweden replied to the communication of 16th of September 2014 on 3rd of November 2014. The Government of the United Kingdom Great Britain and Northern Ireland replied to the communication of the 16th of September 2014 on 13th of November 2014. Sweden and the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland are parties to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The Working Group regards deprivation of liberty as arbitrary in the following cases when it is clearly impossible to invoke any legal basis justifying the deprivation of liberty, as when a person is kept in detention after the completion of his sentence, or despite an amnesty law applicable to him. When the deprivation, depri deprivation of liberty results from the exercise of the rights or freedoms guaranteed by Article 7, 13, 14, 18, 19, 20 and 21 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and insofar as states parties are concerned by Articles 12, 18, 19, 21, 22, 25, 26 and 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Category 2. When the total or partial non-observance of the international norms relating to the Saskia, could you um, share this for me to the Joe Public Says No page as an editor, please, Stalin? International instruments accepted by the states concerned is of such gravity as Thank to give you. the depri deprivation of liberty an arbitrary, ar arbitrary character. When asylum seekers, immigrants or refugees are subjected to prolonged administrative custody without the poss possibility of administrative or judicial review or remedy, 
when the deprivation of liberty constitutes a violation of international law for reasons of discrimination based on birth, national, ethnic or social origin, language, religion, economic condition, political or other opinion, gender, sexual orientation or disability or other status that aims towards or can result in ignoring the equality of human rights. Submissions. Communication from the source. Mr. Julian Assange, born on the 3rd of July 1971, is an Australian national ordinarily residing in Sydney, Australia. He worked as a publisher and journalist prior to his arrest. The source submitted that Mr. Assange had been detained since the 7th of December 2010, including 10 days in isolation in London's Wandsworth Prison, 550 days under house arrest, and thereafter detained in the Embassy of the Republic of Ecuador in London. I'll just give you, um, you guys that have just turned up, I'll just give you a quick overview of what's going on here. Um, uh, Kieran and some of the uh, Julian Assange supporters have come down today to read the UN report into Julian Assange's arbitrary detention. Um, and today we are honoured because we've got Susan Manning with us, who is uh, Chelsea Manning's mum. And I'm hoping to get an interview with her a little bit later on, um, a one-to-one, -one, a very short one, because she's a very fragile lady, I've been told, and uh, is very wary of people like the media, but obviously I'm not the media. So um, I'm really hoping that uh, I can get an, a, a quick interview with her, um, that I will either record or live stream, uh, if uh, I get her permission. Um, but uh, Susan will be down at um, the Ecuadorian Embassy tonight between 6 and 8, along with Vivian Westwood and uh, Lowry Love and um, some musicians, some other keynote speakers. Um, but at the moment, this reading, um, they were going to do about four paragraphs each, and I've just noticed there's about 20 pages there, so I don't actually know how long that's going to go on. But as I say, I'm very excited that um, um, Chelsea Manning's mum's with us, and you can see Chelsea, uh, Chelsea Manning's mum over there talking to Joe Black, uh, the guy with the bowler hat on. Um, Chelsea's mum, Susan, is to his uh, left as you're looking at um, at them. Um, so I'm hoping, as I say, to get an interview with her later. But let's get back to this um, reading. Such as access to potentially exculpatory material. On. You want a break, Joe? I'll go on for a couple more. Okay, on July the 16th. 2014, the Stockholm District Council upheld an arrest warrant for his questioning. The District Court refused to acknowledge that Mr. Assange had been under a deprivation of liberty during his house arrest and during the time he had spent at the Embassy. The District Court only considered that he had been detained for the 10 days he was held in Wandsworth Prison, which was seven 7th to the 16th of December 2010. The District Court had refused to acknowledge Mr. Assange's right to asylum. The source submitted that during the, the period of his detention, Mr. Assange had been deprived of a, a number of his fundamental liberties. It argued that each aspect of the following circumstances has contributed an arbitrary element whose consequence had been or had become arbitrary detention. The, the key elements are inability of Mr. Assange to access the full intended benefit of the grant of asylum by the Republic of Ecuador in August 2012. The continuing and disproportionate denial to him of such access over a period of time in which its impact had become cumulatively harsh and disproportionate. The origins of the justification relied upon for his request to be pursued by Sweden under a European arrest warrant and the way in which that request was validated and pursued with continuing effect to the present time. Thank you, Number 10. 
The source emphasized that Mr. Assange's detention was not by choice. Mr. Assange had an inalienable right to security and to be free from the risk of persecution, inhumane treatment and physical harm. The Republic of Ecuador granted Mr. Assange political asylum in August 2012, recognizing that he would face those well-founded risks if he were extradited to the United States. The only protection he had from that risk at the time was to stay in the confines of the embassy. The only way for Mr. Assange to enjoy his right to asylum was to be in detention. The source highlights that the working group on arbitrary detention had agreed in previous cases that a deprivation of liberty exists where someone is forced to choose between either confinement or forfeiting a fundamental right, such as asylum, and thereby facing a well-founded risk of persecution. In its view, the European Court of Human Rights and the United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees similarly adhere to this principle. The source submits that Mr. Assange was deprived of his liberty against his will, and his liberty had been severely restricted against his volition. An individual cannot be compelled to renounce an inalienable right, nor can they be required to expose themselves to the risk of significant harm. Mr. Assange's exit from the Ecuadorian embassy would require him to renounce his right to asylum and expose himself to the very persecution and risk of physical and mental mistreatment that his grant of asylum was intended to address. His continued presence in the embassy cannot, therefore, be characterized as volitional. The source argues that Mr. Assange's detention is arbitrary and falls under categories 1, 2, 3 and 4 as classified by the working group. In particular, the context of his deprivation of liberty has arisen from the failure of Sweden, which initiated a process against him to obtain his expedition, in the face of contradictory wishes expressed by complainants, having not established a prima facie case and refusing unreasonably and disproportionately to achieve a process of questioning of him, if desired, through the normal processes of mutual assistance. Further, by his offer of cooperation in facilitating a number of alternative methods short of being extradited to Sweden, where it is further stated as a matter of record that he will then be imprisoned in Sweden on arrival and as a foreigner with no ties to Sweden in custody until trial. Further, Mr. Assange is under constant surveillance and the conditions in which he of necessity remains do not adhere to the minimum rules for detainees. The source submits that Mr. Assange has been deprived of fundamental liberties against his will. And the deprivation of Mr. Assange's liberty is arbitrary and illegal. The arbitrary nature of Mr. Assange's confinement in the Embassy of Ecuador in London is grounded in the following factors. Sweden is obliged by applicable law and convention obligations to recognize the asylum granted to Mr. Assange, and no exceptions apply. Categories 2 and 4. Mr. Assange faces a serious risk of refoulement to the United States. The right to asylum and the related protection against refoulement is recognized under customary international law. All right, let me, um, let me just, uh, for those joining the stream now, just to let you know where we are, we're obviously at Downing Street, um, where supporters of Julian Assange are reading the entire UN report on Julian's arbitrary, uh, arbitrary detention um, in the UK. And um, we're very honoured today to have uh, the lady in green there, uh, with the blue rucksack on her back, is Susan Manning, Chelsea Manning's mum. So um, we're absolutely over the moon to have Chelsea Manning, uh, Chelsea Manning's mum with us, uh, a relative of Chelsea, um, who is going to be at the Ecuadorian Embassy later on this evening, between six and eight. Um, I'll be at the Ecuadorian Embassy uh, pretty much as soon as I'm done here. I'm going to jump on a train um, and head over there. Um, so if anyone is rallying there or wants to meet there, that's uh, we'll be there shortly after this uh, broadcast is finished. Um, but yeah. I'm going to go um, back and start uh, uh, and getting close on Lisa so you can hear what's being said. Against reformers, the United States of America.
any hypothetical investigative inconveniences regarding the interview of Mr. Assange by video link or in the embassy pale into insignificance when compared to the grave risk that Ralph Ullemont poses to Mr. Assange's physical and mental integrity. Since the preliminary investigation has not progressed since 2010, it has not been completed in violation of Mr. Assange's right to a speedy resolution of the allegations against him, as per Article 14, Section 1 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. 18. By virtue of the fact that Mr. Assange has been denied the opportunity to provide a statement, which is a fundamental aspect of the Audi Alterum Party principle, and access to exculpatory evidence, Mr. Assange has also been denied the opportunity to defend himself against the allegations. The prosecutor is also fully aware that the practical consequence of this decision is that Mr. Assange is compelled to remain in the confinement of the Ecuadorian Embassy. This failure to consider alternative remedies has therefore consigned Mr. Assange to a lengthy pre-trial detention which greatly exceeds any acceptable length for, a for any uncharged person. The duration of such detention is ipso facto incompatible with the presumption of innocence. 19. Since both the Swedish prosecutor and the Stockholm District Court have refused to consider Mr. Assange's confinement under either house arrest or in the embassy as a form of detention, he has been denied the right to contest the continued necessity and proportionality of the arrest warrant in light of the length of this detention, i.e. his confinement in the Ecuadorian embassy. According to the source, Mr. Assange is effectively serving a sentence for a crime for which he has not even been charged. The Swedish authorities have nonetheless refused to acknowledge that this confinement should be taken into consideration for the purposes of calculating the sentence if Mr. Assange were to be convicted of any crime. His continued confinement therefore exposes him to a likely violation and if convicted in Sweden, he will be forced to serve a further sentence in relation to conduct for which he has already been detained. This is contrary to Article 14, Section 7 of the ICCPR. <coughs> Indefinite nature of this detention and the absence of an effective form of judicial review or remedy concerning the prolonged confinement and the extremely intrusive surveillance to which, to which Mr. Assange has been subjected, Sweden has refused to recognise Mr. Assange's confinement as a form of detention, and as such, he has had no means to seek judicial review as concerns the length and, necessar and necess necessity of such confinement in the embassy. Mr. Assange has been continuously subjected to highly invasive surveillance for the last four years. He has never been disclosed the legal basis for such detention surveillance measures and in fact has little ability to do so as the United States national security investigation against him is still underway. He has thus been deprived of the ability to contest their necessity or proportionality. The prospect of indefinite confinement is in itself a violation of the requirements set out by the Human Rights Committee that a maximum period of detention must be established by law and upon expiry of that period, the detainee must be automatically released. Absence of minimum conditions accepted for prolonged detention of this nature, such as medical treatment and access to outside areas. The Embassy of the Republic of Ecuador in London is not a house or detention centre equipped for prolonged pre-child detention and lacks appropriate and necessary medical equipment or facilities. If Mr. Assange's health were to deteriorate, or if he were to have anything more than a superficial illness, his life would be seriously at risk. Responses from the government, 22. In the communications addressed to the government of Sweden and the government of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, on the 16th of September 2014, the working group transmitted the allegations made by the source. The working group stated that it would appreciate if the governments could, in their reply, 
provide it with detailed information about the current situation of Mr. Assange and clarify the legal provisions justifying his continued detention. The government of Sweden replied to the justifying his continued the government of Sweden replied to the communication of 16th of September 2014 on the 3rd of November 2014. The government of the United Kingdom of Great Britain replied to the communication of the 16th of September 2014 on the 13th of November 2014. According to the government of Sweden, in, on 18th of November 2010, the Swedish prosecutor requested that Mr. Assange should be detained in his absence on probable cause, suspected of rape, two counts of sexual molestation and unlawful coercion. On the same day, the Stockholm District Court decided to detain Mr. Assange in his absence. The decision was upheld by the SVEA Court of Appeal on the 24th of November 2010. In order to execute the detention order, the Swedish prosecutor issued an international arrest warrant as well as a European arrest warrant. Council Framework Decision 2002-584-JHA, hereinafter referred to as the EAW. As understood by the Government of Sweden in February 2011, the City of Westminster Magistrates Court ruled that Mr Assange should be surrendered to Sweden in accordance with the EAW. This decision was upheld by the High Court in a ruling of, in a ruling of 2nd of no November 2011 and by the Supreme Court on the 30th of, 30th of May 2012. As a result of the EAW, Mr Assange was apprehended in the United Kingdom and was detained there between the 7th and the 16th of December 2010. He was thereafter subject to, uh, he was thereafter subject to certain restrictions, such as house arrest. On the 16th of August 2012, Mr Assange was granted asylum by the Republic of Ecuador. And he has since, and he has since June, June 2012 resided at the Ecuadorian Embassy in London. Mr. Assange requested a reconsideration of the detention order before the Stockholm District Court on the 24th of June 2014. On the 16th of July 2014, the Stockholm District Court ruled that the decision on detention in ab absentia should be upheld. Um, Mr. Assange had appealed the decision to the SVEA Court of Appeal and a decision on the matter was still pending. According to the source, Sweden insisted that Mr. Assange must give up his right to political asylum and be extradited to Sweden without any guarantee of non refoulement to the United States. According to the source, Mr. Assange faces a well-founded risk of political persecution and cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment. In this respect, the government would like to submit the following. In its reply, the government of Sweden emphasised that it is important that all countries act in accordance with international human rights standards, including their treaty obligations. 28. The government firstly found it pertinent to clarify the difference between the procedures pertaining to an EAW and the question concerning a guarantee of non refoulement or extradition to a third state. The surrendering of persons within the European Union is based on EU law and the common area for justice and the principle of mutual recognition of judicial decisions and judgments. The EAW applies throughout the EU and it provides improved and simplified judicial procedures designed to surrender people for the person of conducting inter alia, a criminal prosecution. In the current case, an EAW has been issued by a Swedish prosecutor due to the fact that Mr Assange is suspected of serious crime in Sweden and has been detained in his absence for those crimes.
29. The procedures pertaining to extradition is based on multilateral and bilateral treaties as well as on Swedish law, i.e. the Act on Extradition 1957 <laughs> According to the Act, extradition may not be granted unless the criminal act is punishable in Sweden and corresponds to an offence for which imprisonment for one year or more is prescribed by Swedish law. If there is a risk of persecution or under certain conditions, if the offence is considered to be a military offence or a political offence, extradition may not be granted. Furthermore, an extradited person may not have the death penalty imposed for the offence imposed for the offence. A decision on extradition is taken by the government after an investigation and, a, and opinion by the Prosecutor General's office and in case the person sought does not consent to extradition, a subsequent decision by the Swedish Supreme Court. Should the, should the Supreme Court find that there are any obstacles in extradition, the government is bound by this decision. Number 30. The government of Sweden found it was important to emphasise that to this date no request for extradition regarding Mr Assange has been directed to Sweden. Any discussion about any extradition of Mr Assange to a third state is therefore strictly hypothetical. Furthermore, as has been explained above, any potential decision for extradition must be preceded by a thorough and careful examination of all the circumstances of the particular case. Such an examination cannot be made before a state has requested extradition of a specific person and specified the reasons invoked in support of the request. In addition, if a person has been surrendered to Sweden pursuant to an e EAW, Sweden must obtain the consent of the surrendering state, in this case the United Kingdom, before being able to extradite the person sought to a third country. In light of the above, the government refutes the submission made by the source that Mr Assange faces a risk of reform to the United States. 31. In any case, the government holds that the Swedish extradition and EAW procedures contain sufficient safeguards against any potential extradition in violation of international human rights agreements. 32. In relation to the submission by the source that Sweden is obliged by applicable law and convention obligations to recognise the diplomatic asylum granted to Mr Assange by the authorities of the Republic of Ecuador, the government submitted the following. 33. Regrettably, the source does not specify which law and convention obligation Sweden is obliged to recognise. However, in the government's opinion, general international law does not recognise a right of dip diplomatic asylum as implied by the source. The International Court of Justice has confirmed this fundamental position. The government would also like to emphasise that the Latin American Convention on Diplomatic Asylum does not constitute general international law. On the contrary, it is a regional instrument and no similar instruments or practices exist elsewhere. Accordingly, the government does not find itself bound by aforementioned regulations. 34. It should furthermore be noted that according to relevant international instruments, including the Latin American Convention on Diplomatic Asylum, the right to seek and enjoy asylum does not apply if an, if an applicant as ground of asylum invo invokes that he or she is wanted for ordinary non-political crime see, uh, for example, Article 14 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In this respect, the government notes that Mr Assange is suspected of rape, sexual molestation and unlaw unlawful coercion, all non-political crimes, and can therefore not rely on the above legal frame frameworks in this respect. 35. In light of the, the above, the government refutes the source's allegations that Sweden is obliged by applicable law and convention and convention obligations to recognise the asylum granted. 36. 
The source further alleges that Mr. Assange's detention is arbitrary. Is arbitrary. I've got, a, I've got a problem with that word. Arbitrary. Ar arbitrary. And falls under categories one, two, three, and four, as classified by the working group. Um, is this six or four? That's four. That is four, yeah. In this regard, um, the government of Sweden firstly noted that the source has not explained how the situation of Mr. Assange corresponds to the above-mentioned criteria adopted by the Working Group on ar Arbitrary Detention. For example, the government noted that except for the sources mentioning of Article 14 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, it is unclear under which other relevant international legal framework, if any, Mr. Assange is invoking his rights. 37. In any case, the government contests that Mr. Assange is being deprived of his liberty in violation of the criteria adopted by the working group that, and that accordingly the minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners would apply to, to his situation. In this regard, the government notes that Mr. Assange volun voluntarily has chosen to reside at the Ecuadorian Embassy. Mr. Assange is More free to leave lives. the Ab Mr. Assange is free to leave the embassy at any point and Swedish authorities have no control over his decision to stay at the embassy. Mr. Assange can therefore not be regarded as being deprived of his liberty due to any decision or action taken by the Swedish authority. In this respect, the government specifically notes that there is no causal link between Mr. Assange's current situation at the Ecuadorian Embassy and the EAW issued by the Swedish authorities, CF Opinion Number 9-2008, Yemen, and Opinion Number 30-2012, Islamic Republic of Iran. The government holds that Mr. Assange is free to leave the Ecuadorian Embassy at any, any point in time. 38. In relation to the submission that Mr. Assange does not have the formal rights of a defendant during the Swedish preliminary um, investigation, such as access to potentially exculpatory material, the government submitted the following. 39. In Sweden, a Swedish authority, usually a prosecutor or a police officer, is responsible for conducting a preliminary investigation. The purpose of the preliminary investigation is to produce all the evidence in favour of or against a crime and a particular suspect. During the preliminary investigation, a suspect is entitled to examine all the investigation material upon which the allegation is based and to request the police to carry out further investigations, such as questioning the witnesses. The prosecutor is not allowed to issue an indictment unless the, suspe the, su the suspect has declared that no further actions or measures are required in the preliminary investigation. 40. It may be added that since 1995, the European Convention on Human Rights, as well as the additional protocols ratified by Sweden form part of Swedish law. Article 6 of the Convention is therefore an, integ an integrated part of Swedish legislation. Hence, the Swedish legislation regarding the criminal procedure, including the preliminary investigations, meets the requirements of the Convention. In light of the above, the submission that Mr. Assange does not have the formal rights of a defendant lacks merit. 41. As regards the submission that Mr. Assange's deprivation of liberty has risen from Sweden's failure in refusing to, to consider alternative mechanisms and to question him through the procedures of mutual legal assistance, the government holds the following. 42. To begin with, according to the Swedish Instrument of Government, 1974, 152, the Swedish government may not interfere in an ongoing case handled by a Swedish public authority. 
Swedish authorities, including the, the office of the prosecutor and the courts, are thus in independent and separated from the government. In the case at hand, the Swedish prosecutor in charge of the preliminary uh, investigation has determined that Mr. Assange's personal presence is necessary for the investigation of the crimes of which he is suspected. The prosecutor has the best knowledge of the ongoing criminal investi investigation and is therefore best placed to determine the specific actions needed during the preliminary investigation. In relation to suspicions of serious crimes, such as the ones at hand, the interests of the victims are an important aspect of the considerations made by the prosecutor. 43. As regards Mr Assange's potential detention in Sweden, the government would like to clarify that as soon as Mr Assange is in Sweden, the prosecutor must notify the district court. A new hearing will then be held before the court, where Mr Assange attends personally. Thus, it is always for the district court to decide upon the issue of whether Mr Assange should be detained or released. 44. The source also submits that the Stockholm District Court, in its decision on detention on the 16th of July 2014, refused to acknowledge Mr Assange's right to asylum. In this respect, the government may clarify the following. 45. In its decision on the 16th of July 2014, case number B12885-10, the Stockholm District Court ruled exclusively on the matter of whether Mr Assange should continue to be detained in his absence. Essentially, the District Court stated the following. As a, result, as, as a result of the EAW, Mr. Assange has been detained in the period between 7 to 16th of December 2010, and he has thereafter been subject to various restrictions. These have, without being equated with a deprivation of liberty, of course, been very tough for Mr. Assange. The fact that Mr. Assange chooses to remain in the Ecuadorian Embassy in the United Kingdom is, in the court's opinion, not to be considered as a deprivation of liberty and should therefore not be regarded as a consequence of the, of the decision to detain him in his absence. The District Court further stated that it does not seem to be possible to surrender Mr Assange at present as he is residing at an embassy, but, but that this is not sufficient reason to resign the order for his detention. However, the District Court makes no reference to Mr. Assange's potential right to asylum, as suggested by the source. We're going to take a break, all right. Oh, this could take some time. I've just seen how many pages there are there. <clears throat> Might have been better doing this at the Ecuadorian. 46. Fire. OK, I'm going to give it my best go shot. Go on, go for it. Um, because we know, according to the uh, Italian journalists applied to the High Court, uh, for emails from the uh, Crown Prosecution Service to the Swedish prosecutors, where it was evident that the Swedes wanted to drop the inquiry in 2013, and the Crown Prosecution basically said, don't get cold feet, that's a direct quote, uh, but don't come and interview him, and don't enhance the process of the investigation. So the whole thing's been a, a holding action, mm, and uh, yeah. a, a successful one at that, and that, an attempt to marginalise him. Um, and of course, the Guardian newspapers are worse offenders than this. Um, the, the slander they stoop to. And I taught high school. You wouldn't even get that in a high school in Australia. No. You, might, you might get it in a primary school yeah, yeah. without having smelly feet or something, you know, like, really? Yeah. So he obviously upsets the Oxbridge lads of the, the Guardian because he, you know, yeah. he came through 37 high schools. So, and this country is so obsessed with class. You've got yeah. to know your place. Oh, and yeah. Julian Assange does not know his place. No, no. Um, we're up to 46. 46. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go at a slower pace. And I'm going to have my water there. 46. In sum, and with reference to what has been stated above, and in response to the invitation of the working group, the government holds that Mr Assange does not face a risk of refoulement contrary to international human rights obligations to the United States, that Sweden is not obliged by applicable law and convention obligations to recognise diplomatic asylum granted to Mr Assange. 
that Mr Assange is currently not deprived of his liberty in violation of the criteria adopted by the working group, and that international law as well as other treaty obligations are being compiled with by the Swedish authorities when handling the criminal investigation related to Mr Assange. 47. According to the Government of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Mr Assange entered the Ecuadorian Embassy in London of his own free will on the 19th of June 2012, six years ago today. Mm. He's therefore been there for over two years back then. He was free to leave at any point. Well, you're free to walk off a cliff too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the Ecuadorian Government granted Mr Assange diplomatic asylum under the 1954 Caracas Convention, not political asylum. The UK is not a party to the Caracas Convention and does not recognise diplomatic asylum. Therefore, the UK is under no legal obligation to arise from Ecuador's decision. The UK government considers that the use of the Ecuadorian embassy the UK government considers that the use of the Ecuadorian embassy premises to enable Mr. Assange to avoid arrest is incompatible with the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Mr. Assange is wanted for interview in Sweden in connection with allegations of serious offences. He is subject to a European arrest warrant in relation to these allegations. The UK has a legal obligation to extradite him to Sweden. The British government takes violence, number 50. The British government takes violence against women extremely seriously, of course, unless they're bombing the shit out of them. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, seriously, and cooperates with European and other partners in ensuring justice is done. And now, comments from the source, 51. On 14th November 2014, the source submitted its comments for the responses of the government of Sweden. Number 52. According to the source, the government of Sweden and the government of the United Kingdom of Great Britain have continued Mr Assange's unjust, unreasonable, unnecessary and disproportionate confinement. Over time, the basis for Mr Assange's confinement has become so disproportionate as to have become arbitrary. That's interesting. Since 18th of November 2010, when a court ordered a domestic arrest warrant with a Swedish prosecutor, it transformed into an international arrest warrant, EAW and Interpol Red Notice, in December 2010, without judicial oversight. It's only signed by a cop. Mr. Assange still has not been charged. Since his arrest in London on December 7, 2010, at the request of Sweden, Mr. Assange has suffered various forms of deprivation of liberty, including confinement to the Ecuadorian embassy from June 2012. Police continued to surround the embassy, continued to obstruct his asylum, and continued their attempts to surveil his visitors. I was one of them. <laughs> and activities both physically and electronically. 54. On 29th of October 2014, in response to an invitation by the United Kingdom, and prior to Sweden's response, the Swedish prosecutor again refused to move the case forward by questioning Mr Assange. His chances of an independent, rigorous and fair process had already been significantly undermined because notwithstanding his right to benefit from presumption of innocence, Mr Assange had been deprived of his liberty for more than the applicable maximum sentence that would apply to the Swedish allegations. Yeah, have in the background. Look. Um, 55. The source considered that the transmitted response clearly had set out the Swedish government's position that it would do nothing to stop Mr. Assange's indefinite detention, despite the passage of time and its consequent impact upon Mr. Assange. 56. The source emphasised that in its response to the Swedish government, conceded that Mr. Assange's situation caused by Sweden was very tough. Very to comments. It failed to address a single. Are you ready? Okay. okay. <laughs> I, I, I was just finished 56. Legal authority cited by Mr. Assange demonstrating that he was deprived of liberty and that this deprivation was arbitrary. In particular, the legal authority cited in Mr. Assange's submission showed that an arbitrary deprivation of liberty arises where a state forces an individual to choose commas, between confinement and risk and prosecution. Confinement and the ability to apply for asylum, indefinite confinement and deportation, and several other circumstances where an individual feels com compelled to choose to suffer indefinite confinement. The government of Sweden had no reply to these authorities. Please. The source further underlined that in its response, the Swedish government refused to consider the grounds for Mr Assange's asylum under the 1951 Refugee Convention, customary international law, and any other mechanism that was derivative of the Jews' cogens norm of non-reformment. 
translator, please. The government of Sweden replied with silence on 1951 refugee convention framework and failed to recognise that it had obligations in relation to the factual circumstances that gave rise to Mr. Assange's asylum. Sweden failed to recognise humanitarian grounds for asylum, contradicted state practice, including Sweden's own practice. Hey, Lise, Lise. Yes. 58. I'll do when we finish this. Okay. All right. There's a lot of pages there. How much? There's a lot of pages. Yeah, might as well go for broke. Yeah. Yeah. The source stated that the government of Sweden sets out its political position in relation to Mr. Assange's asylum. The government refused the source's allegation that Sweden is obligated to recognise the asylum granted. The reply did not devote a single word to the position set out in the Assange's submission concerning Sweden's duty to afford mutual recognition to asylum decisions issued by other states within the framework of the 1951 Convention. The source asserted that Sweden's obligations arise into ALIA under the 1951 Convention itself, to which it is signatory in Article 18 of the EU Charter, an examination of the grounds for Ecuador's decision, including the Jus Cogens norm of non refoulement is also absent from Sweden's reply. At your own pace. 59. According to the source, as affirmed by the UNHCR, states do not grant refugee status to persons. Their decisions are declaratory in the sense that they simply recognise that there are well-founded grounds to consider that the person is a refugee. In this sense, the point is not merely whether Sweden is obliged to recognise Ecuador's asylum decisions, but whether Sweden can ignore the fact that there has been an elaborate evidential determination that Mr. Assange faces a risk of persecution and cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment. UNHCR has further confirmed that the principle of non refoulement applies not only to recognised refugees, but also to those who have not had their status formally declared. Accordingly, the possibility that Sweden's position is not to recognise the diplomatic portion of Ecuador's asylum decision does not exempt it from either A, recognising Ecuador's asylum assessment of Mr Assange as a refugee under the 1951 Refugee Convention, or B, its independent obligation to ensure that its domestic decisions do not ignore the evidential presumption that Mr Assange requires protection from the risk of refoulement to the United States. 61. With regard to the narrow exclusion clause invoked by Sweden in its response, the source claimed that the government misunderstood both the clause and the grounds for Mr Assange's asylum. In particular, the statement of the Swedish government in its response that the right to seek and enjoy asylum does not apply if an, if an applicant, as grounds of asylum, invokes that he or she is wanted for ordinary non-political crime. The exclusion clause, as applied by Sweden's response, misconstrues the grounds for Mr Assange's asylum. The grounds for Mr Assange's asylum have grown stronger over time. On the 19th of May this year, 2.15, the United States stated in its court submissions that the investigation against Mr Assange is an ongoing Department of Just Justice the DOJ and FBI criminal investigation and pending further prosecution and that the United States government has been very clear that main multi-subject criminal investigation of the DOJ and FBI remains open and pending. The source emphasised that notwithstanding that the United States continued to build its case against Mr Assange while he was trapped in the embassy and could at any moment file an extradition request of its own, Formally, had Sweden not issued a European arrest warrant for Mr Assange, he would not have presently faced arrest upon departure, nor would he have been subjected to the current intrusive regime of surveillance and controls at the Ecuadorian Embassy. Thus, his deprivation of liberty was governed by Sweden's maintenance of its extradition warrant and therefore falls under the authority of Sweden. The source also asserted that the response of the government of Sweden failed to acknowledge Sweden's own practice of affording diplomatic asylum. In particular, in its response, the government of Sweden stated that no practices exist in general information law to support the, information, the institution of diplomatic asylum. Sweden's position was incongruous with the fact that Sweden had itself recognised 
that states have, under general international law, a right and a duty in certain cases to provide diplomatic asylum on humanitarian grounds. The source claimed that Sweden could not resile from its own practice simply because it was responding to Mr Assange's complaint. In its comments, the source stated that Sweden not only misrepresented the grounds for Mr Assange's asylum, it also failed to address the fact that Mr Assange applied for and obtained asylum in relation to the actions against him by the United States of America and the risk of political persecution and cruel inhuman and degrading treatment. The source further argued that the response of the Swedish government asserted that Mr Assange's confinement in the embassy was voluntary and that Swedish authorities have no control over his decision to stay at the embassy, that he is free to leave the Ecuadorian embassy at any point in time and there is no causal link between the Swedish EAW and Mr Assange's confinement. However, even the Swedish Prosecution Authority, as recently as July 2014, described Mr Assange's case in relation to its warrant against him as remaining in custody and Mr Assange's being still detained. With regard to the right to independent, rigorous and fair process, the source stated that beside that Mr Assange had not yet been formally charged, contrary to the general statement of Sweden's response, claiming that in Sweden, during a preliminary investigation, a suspect is entitled to examine all the investigation material upon which the allegation is based. Neither the Swedish court nor Mr Assange had been granted access to hundreds of potentially exculpatory SMS messages, thereby violating Mr Assange's right to effective judicial protection. According to the source, in light of Sweden's concession that Mr Assange's situation is very tough, the government of the United Kingdom of Great Britain seem to forget that those seeking asylum and those who obtain it, like Mr Assange, are hardly making a choice based on free will, but one based on escaping persecution. Leaving the embassy would force him to renounce his asylum and expose himself to a risk of persecution and cruel, inhuman treatment. The source asserted that the response of the UK government revealed its position to do nothing to stop Mr Assange's indefinite detention, despite the passage of time and its compact upon him, Mr Assange and his family. First, the response did not devote a single word concerning to the United Kingdom's duty to afford mutual recognition to asylum decisions issued by other states within the framework of the 1951 Convention. Secondly, the United Kingdom firmly further complained that Mr Assange was not granted political asylum but was indeed granted asylum under the Caracas Convention and that because the United Kingdom was not a party to the Caracas Convention, it has no obligation to recognise it. Sweden, the United Kingdom and Ecuador are parties to the 1951 Refugee Convention, which places on states an obligation to respect non refoulement with no reservations. The source also asserted that in its response, the United Kingdom suggested that Mr Assange's extradition was deemed to be fair and proportionate by the UK Supreme Court. However, that decision predated the current ability of UK courts to consider proportionality in extradition cases. It was a complaint by the Supreme Court on exactly this point in relation to Mr Assange that led to corrective legislation that came into force in 2014. The corrective UK legislation addressed the court's inability to conduct a proportionality assessment of the Swedish prosecutor's international arrest warrant, corrected by Section 157 of the Anti-Social Behaviour, Crime and Policing Act 2014, in force since July this year. This corrective legislation also barred extradition where no decision to bring a person to trial has been made. The prosecutor in Sweden does not dispute that she has not yet made a decision to bring the case to trial, let alone charge Mr Assange. The source asserted that, he, that the legal basis for Mr Assange's extradition has further eroded. The UK's response even rested its assertion on a Supreme Court decision which even the Supreme Court 
because this is distance itself from. In uh, Buckney's case, the Supreme Court revisited its split decision in Assange versus Swedish Prosecution Authority and explained that the single argument which had become the decisive point in Assange had been reached incorrectly. Nevertheless, the corrective legislation in domestic UK law excluded any individual whose case had already been decided by the UK courts. Thus, Mr Assange was frozen out of a remedy, further contributing to his legally uncertain and precarious situation without a willingness on the part of the United Kingdom to review the case given the subsequent circumstances, the granting of asylum and with it the principle of the retroactive application of the law which was favourable to the accused in accordance with the jurisprudence of the ECTHR. The corrective legislation was passed to prevent arbitrary detention, to prevent people languishing in prison awaiting trial. But now the United Kingdom is not remedying the very case that led to it. The passage of the new legislation is an admission of previous unfairness Whenever you need a break, show and the very person abused by it is not getting its benefit. The source also claimed that in its response, the UK government failed to recognise that Mr Assange's chances of receiving an independent, rigorous and fair process had already been fatally and irreparably undermined. At a very minimum, the United Kingdom should have recognised that Mr Assange had been denied a speedy investigation and the right to defend himself. And had he and he had been kept under different forms of deprivation of liberty which amount to the arbitrary detention he was currently subjected to. Additionally, Mr Assange had been, from the beginning of the Swedish investigation, denied an independent, rigorous and fair process. The source alleged that the United Kingdom completely failed to respond to the arguments that there was a lack of fair process and prejudice faced by Mr Assange due to the fact that the existence of a confidential preliminary investigation against Mr Assange had been unlawfully disclosed to a tabloid newspaper, newspaper expressed by the Swedish Prosecution Authority within hours of its commencement, which led to a perception that there is a formal accusation against Mr Assange. 83. Finally, the source claimed that the United Kingdom did not address any of Mr Assange's um, the substantive rights um, or the wealth of authorities addressed in its complaint. The United Kingdom failed to recognise his right to asylum or to offer him safe passage. Mr Assange faces ongoing indefinite detention and the serious compromise of his health and family life, which is a violation of numerous conventions to which the United Kingdom is a party. The UK government's response proposed no relief and only served to reinforce the indefinite and arbitrary nature of Mr Assange's confinement. Discussion 84. The question that was posed to the working group is whether the current situation of Mr Assange corresponds to any of the five categories of arbitrary detention applied by the working group in the consideration of the cases brought to its attention. At the outset, the working group notes with concern that Mr Assange has been subjected to different forms of deprivation of liberty ever since the 7th of December 2010 to this date as a result of both the actions and the inactions of the State of Sweden and the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. 86. Firstly, Mr Assange was held in isolation in the Wandsworth Prison in London for 10 days from the 7th of December to the 16th of December 2010 and this was not challenged by any of the two respondent states. In this regard, the working group expresses its concern that he was detained in isolation at the very beginning of the episode that lasted longer than five years. The arbitrariness is inherent in this form of deprivation of liberty. If the individual, if the individual is left outside the cloak of legal protection, including the access to legal assistance, um, 60, 60 of the working group's deliberation number nine concerning the definition and scope of arbitrary deprivation of liberty under 
customary law. Such a practice of law in general corresponds to the violations of both rules prescribing arbitrary detention and ensuring the right to a fair trial as guaranteed by Articles 9 and 10 of the UDHR and Article 7, 9, 9, um, uh, 1 of 9, 3 of 9, 4 of 9, 10 and 14 of the ICCPR. 87. That initial deprivation of liberty then continued in the form of house arrest for some 550 days. This again was not contested by any of the two states. During this prolonged period of house arrest, Mr Assange had been sub subjected to various forms of harsh restrictions, including monitoring using an electric tag, an obligation to report to the police every day, and a bar on being outside of his place of residence at night. In this regard, the working group has no choice but to query what has, what has prohibited the unfolding of judicial management of any kind in a reasonable manner from occurring for such extended period of time. 88. It is during that, that period that he has sought refuge at the Embassy of the Republic of Ecuador in London. Despite the fact that the Republic of Ecuador has granted him asylum in August 2012, his newly acquired status has not been recognised by neither Sweden nor the UK. Mr Assange has been subjected to extensive surveillance by the British police during his stay at the Ecuadorian Embassy to this date. 89. In view of the foregoing, the working group considers that in, viola in violation of Articles 9 and 10 of the Universal Decl Declaration of Human Rights, and Articles 9 and 14 of the International Covenant on Civil and, Polit and Political Rights, ICCPR. Mr Assange has not been guaranteed the international norms of due process and the guarantees to a fair trial during these three different moments. The detention in isolation in Wandsworth Prison, the 550 days under house arrest, and the continuation of the deprivation of liberty in the Embassy of the Republic of Ecuador in London, United Kingdom. The working group also views that Mr Assange's stay at the Embassy of the Republic of Ecuador in London to this day should be considered as a, as a prolongation of the already continued deprivation of liberty that has been conducted in breach of the principles of reasonableness, necessity and proportionality. 91. The working group in its deliberation number 9 had already confirmed its position on the definition of arbitrary detention. What matters in the expression arbitrary detention is essentially the word arbitrary. I.e. The elimination in all its forms of arbitrariness, of arbitrariness, whatever the phase of deprivation of liberty concerned. Right, really quick. Um, uh, quick, 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 quick. Placing right, individuals in temporary Alex. custody. Placing individuals in temporary custody in stations, ports and airports, or any other facilities where they remain under constant surveillance may not only amount to restrictions to personal freedom of movement, but also constitute a de facto deprivation of liberty, para 59. The notion of arbitrary, stricto sensu, sensu includes both the requirement that a, a, a particular form of deprivation of liberty is taken in accordance with the applicable law and procedure, that it is proportional to the aim sought, reasonable and necessary, para 61. 92. The Human Rights Committee, in its general comment, number 35 on, on Article 9, also stated that an arrest or detention may be authorised by domestic law and nonetheless be arbitrary. The notion of arbitrariness is not to be equated with against law, 
but must be interpreted, interpreted more broadly to include elements of inappropriateness and inappropriateness, injustice, lack of predictability and due process of law, as well as elements of reasonableness, necessity and proportionality. Para 12, as was reiterated in Para 60, 61 of the deliberation number 9 of the working group. 93. The working group is concerned that the only basis of the deprivation of liberty of Mr. Assange appears to be the, Euro the European arrest war warrant issued by the Swedish prosecution based on a, on a criminal allegation. Until the date of the adoption of this opinion, Mr. S Mr. Assange has never been formally in um, indicted in Sweden. Uh, the European arrest warrant was issued for the purpose of conducting preliminary investigation in order to determine whether it will lead to an indictment or not. In its uh, 94, in its reply, the Swedish uh, government um, indicated that according to Swedish law, a suspect is entitled to examine all the investigation material upon which the allegation is based. The working group notes in this regard that Mr. Assange has not been granted access to any material of such which is in violation of Article 14 of ICCPR 95. At this point, it is noteworthy that the working group, while examining the essential safeguards for the prevention of torture, stressed that, stressed that prompt and regular access should be given to independent medical personnel and lawyers and under appropriate supervision when the legitimate purpose of the detention so requires to family members. Para 58, the deliberation number 9. The right to personal security in Article 9, Paragraph 1 of the ICCPR is relevant to the treatment of both detained and non-detained persons. The appropriateness of the conditions prevailing in detention to the purpose of detention is sometimes a factor in determine, determining whether detention is ar arbitrary within the meaning of Article 9 of the ICCPR. Certain conditions of detention, such as access to counsel and family, may result in procedural uh, violations of paragraphs 3 and 4 of Article 9, para 59, the Deliberation 9, 96. With regard to the application of the principle of proportionality, it is also worth mentioning that Lord Reid of the UK Supreme Court, Bank Mallet, um, the, Her, Majesty, Her Majesty's Treasury, 2013, UKSC 39, per Lord Reed's Para 74, set out that it is necessary to determine, one, whether the objective of the measure is sufficiently important to justify the limitation of a protected rights, two, whether the measure is rationally connected to the objective, three, whether a less intrusive measure could have been used without um, unaccept, uh, unacceptably com compromising the, the achievement of the objective. Four, whether balancing the severity of the measure's effects on the rights of the persons to whom it applies against the importance of the objective to the extent um, that the measure will contribute to its achievement, the former outweighs the latter. 97. The working group also views that there has been um, a substantial failure to exercise due diligence on the part of, of the concerned states with regard to the performance of criminal administration given the following factual elements. 1. In the case of Mr Assange, after more than five years of time lapse, he is still left even before the stage of preliminary investigation with no predictability as to whether and when a formal process of any judicial dealing would, commen would commence. 2. Despite that it is left to the initial choice of the Swedish prosecution, as to what mode of investigation would best suit the purpose of criminal justice, the exercise and implementation of the investigation method should be 
conducted in compliance with the rule of proportionality, including undertaking to explore alternative ways of administering justice. Three, unlike other suspects in general whose whereabouts are either unknown or unidentifiable and whose spirit of cooperation is uh, non-existent, Mr. Assange, while staying under constant and highly intrusive surveillance, has continued to express his willingness to participate in the criminal investigation. Four, as a consequence, his situation now has become both excessive and unnecessary. From a time perspective, uh, it, is, it is worse than if he had appeared in Sweden for questioning and possible legal proceeding when first summoned to do so. Five, irrespective of whether the grant of the asylum by the Republic of Ecuador to Mr. Assange should be acknowledged by the concerned states and whether the concerned states could have endorsed the decision and wish of the Republic of Ecuador, as they had previously done on the humanitarian grounds, the grant itself and the fear of persecution on the part of Mr. Assange based on the possibility of extradition should have been given fuller consideration in the determination and the exercise of criminal administration instead of being subjected to a sweeping judgment as defining either merely hypothetical or irrelevant. Six, it defeats the purpose and efficiency of justice and the interest of the concerned victims to put this matter of investigation to a state of indefinite procrastination. 98. The working group is convinced once again that, among others, the current situation of Mr. Assange staying with the confines of the Embassy of the Republic of Ecuador in London, United Kingdom, has become a state of an arbitrary deprivation of liberty. The factual elements and the to um, totality of the circumstances that have led to this conclusion include the followings. One, Mr. Assange has been denied the opportunity to provide a statement, which is a fundamental aspect of the something in Latin, I can't read, principle, to uh, access the exculpatory um, uh, evidence and thus the opportunity to defend himself against the allegations. Two, the duration of such detention is ipso facto incompatible with the presumption of innocence. Mr. Assange has been denied the right to contest the continued necessity and proportionality of the arrest warrant in light of the length of this detention, i.e. his confinement, confinement in the Ecuadorian embassy. Three, the indefinite nature of this detention and the absence of an effective form of judicial review or remedy concerning the prolonged confinement and the highly intrusive surveillance to which Mr. Assange has been subjected. Four, the Embassy of the Republic of Ecuador in London is not and far less than a, um, is not and far less than a house or detention center equipped for prolonged pre-trial detention and lacks appropriate and necessary medical equipment or facilities. It is valid to assume, after five years of deprivation of liberty, Mr. Assange's health could have been uh, deteriorated to a level that anything more than a superficial illness would put his health at a serious risk and he was denied his access to a medical institution for a proper diagnosis including taking an MRI test. Five, with regard to the legality of the EAW since the final decision by the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom in Mr. Assange's case, UK domestic law on the determinative issues had been drastically changed, including as a result of perceived abuses raised by Sweden's EAW, so that if requested, Mr. Assange's extradition would not have been permitted by the UK. Nevertheless, the government of the United Kingdom has stated, um, has stated in relation to Mr. As Mr. Mr. Assange that these changes are not retrospective and so may not benefit him. A position is maintained in which his confinement within the Ecuadorian embassy is likely to continue indefinitely.
The corrective UK legislation addressed the court's inability to conduct a proportionality assessment of the Swedish prosecutor's international arrest warrant, corrected by 157 of the Anti-Social Behaviour, Crime and um, Policing Act 2014, in force since July the 14th, uh, July the um, July 2014. The corrective legislation also barred extradition where no decision to bring a person to trial has been made. 156. Disposition 99. In the light of the foregoing, the working group renders the following opinion. The deprivation of liberty of Mr. Assange is arbitrary and in contravention of Articles 9 and 10 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Article 7, 1 of 9, 3 of 9, 4 of 9, 10 and 14 of the International Covenant in Civil and Political Rights. It falls within Category 3 of the categories applicable to the consideration of the cases submitted to the Working Group. 100. Consequent upon the opinion rendered, the Working Group requests the Government of Sweden and the Government of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to assess the situation of Mr Assange, to ensure his safety and physical integrity, to facilitate the exercise of his right to freedom of movement in an expedient manner, and to ensure the full enjoyment of his rights guaranteed by the international norms on detention. 101. The working group considers that, taking into account all the circumstances of the case, the adequate remedy would be to ensure the right of free movement of Mr. Assange and accord him an enforceable right to compensation in accordance with Article 5 of 9, um, 5 of, 9 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Thank you very much, Joe. Right, well, there you have the uh, complete uh, UN report there. Um, it was hard going actually, I didn't realise there was that many pages. Let me just uh, see if that changes, there you go. It's a bit bright out here. Um, so I think what we're going to do now, um, it seems to me that half of everyone's disappeared off. Um, Kieran's still here, Joe's still here, Lisa's still here. Um, I'm going to head over to the Ecuadorian Embassy now because I did say I was going to be there at 12 and it's now fucking nearly 4 o'clock. Um, so I'm going to head on over there just in case people have turned up and gone what rally um, so uh, I'll, um, I'll just switch this camera back and give you a little bit more of what's going on around here there you go. Yeah. Right. we're on the last page I thought we'd finished as to the scope of the mandate of the working group Two, it is assumed in the opinion that Mr. Assange has been detained in the Embassy of Ecuador in London by the authorities of the United Kingdom. In particular, it is stated that his stay in the Embassy constitutes a state of an arbitrary deprivation of liberty. In fact, Mr. Assange fled the bail in June 2012 and since then stays at the premises of the Embassy, using them as a safe haven to evade arrest. Indeed, fugitives are often self-confined within the places where they evade arrest and detention. This could be some premises, as in Mr. Assange's situation or the territory of the state that does not recognize the arrest warrant. However, these territories and premises of self-confinement cannot be considered as places of detention for the purposes of the mandate of the working group. In regard to the House arrest of Mr. Assange in 2011 and 2012, it was previously emphasized by the working group that where the person is allowed to leave the resistance, as in Mr. Assange's case, it is a form of restriction of liberty rather than deprivation of liberty, a measure which would then lie outside the group's competence. Uh, Mr. Assange was allowed to leave the mansion where he was supposed to reside while litigating against extradition in the courts of the United Kingdom. As soon as his last application was dismissed by the Supreme Court in June 2012, Mr. Assange fled the bail. The mandate of the working group is not without limits. By definition, the working group is not competent to consider situations that do not involve deprivation of liberty. For the same reason, 
Issues related to the fugitive's self-confinement, such as asylum and extradition, do not fall into the mandate of the working group. Look at this that is not this. to say that the complaints of Mr. Assange so could not have been considered. There exists the appropriate UN and human rights treaty bodies and the European Court of Human Rights Go that do have place. mandated examine such complaints regardless whether they involve deprivation of liberty or not. Incidentally, any further application of Mr. Assange may now be declared inadmissible in an appropriate UN body or ECHR on the matters that have been considered by the working group. In this regard, one may refer to the ECHR decision in front of France and the reservation of Sweden to the first optional protocol to ICCPR. Excellent. Thank you, Sylvie. How are you? Haven't seen you for a while. All right, not too bad. Cool. Right, I'm going to, um, I think I'm going to end the live stream there for here because, uh, I, like I say, I really want to get off to the Ecuadorian embassy because I told people to rally there from 12 o'clock and I haven't even got there myself yet and it's got to be close to 4 o'clock now. Um, so I'm just going to go and uh, throw Kieran's phone back off him, at him, pick up my kit and get on a, get on a train. Yeah, with respect, mate, I've got your phone and stuff to carry. <laughs> nah, it's all right. This, that's heavy. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's all right. Come on, man, I'm trying to... Thank you. And is that the cord as well? Huh? The plug at the cord? It's still on here. It's just been ripped okay. out. Right, yeah, as I say, I'm, I'm going to end this live stream now because it's all um, going a bit, all fraying at the edges. Um, I'd rather be over at the Ecuadorian embassy, so I'm going to go and jump on a, I'm going to go and jump on a train now, and um, I'll do a broadcast from the embassy when I get there. It shouldn't take me more than 10, 15 minutes to, um, to walk there. Um, if you could tweet this um, link, please. Uh, John, I know you follow my um, John Watson. I know you follow my Twitter. Could you do me a favour, mate? Could you take this link and tweet it with at Kieran O'Reilly? That's C I A R O N um, O'Reilly and at Susie Three D. Um, which is Susie and then the number three and D and maybe if you can uh, Elizabeth Lee Voss L-E-A-V-O-S Lee Voss um, I, I'll, I'll try and do it when I get there anyway it's just that for some reason this um, this stream wouldn't allow me to tag Joe Public it wouldn't allow me to tag um, uh, whistleblowers or to um, uh, put in any acts at all really so any help sharing this would be appreciated um, sorry it's been a bit patchy wouldn't have been my suggestion to, to read that article or that UN report here it's just too noisy what with you know the traffic the sirens and motorbikes um, it might have been a bit more advantageous to, to read it over at the Ecuadorian embassy because uh, Hans Crescent is a lovely quiet road um, but yeah I'll um, I'll leave this stream for now and um, I will be doing a, 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 a live stream uh, over at the Ecuadorian embassy uh, once I know what's going on. So I'll catch you all soon. Thank you all for tuning in.